So recently, Treehouse Brewing Company has been putting out some amazing YouTube content. And if you are at all involved in the home brewing scene on YouTube, it is most obvious that they put out a recipe. The recipe was both in short format and in long form format. And it was narrated and guided by Nate Lanier, the head brewer and co-founder of Treehouse Brewing Company. That man knows a thing or two about making IPAs. So when somebody like him says, this is how you brew an IPA treehouse style, you pay attention. So today, we are gonna be brewing up that recipe. Is it a recipe to one treehouse's actual beers? I highly doubt that, but it is nonetheless an IPA recipe crafted by one of the masters, and that is absolutely worth something. So we're gonna break it down, and we're gonna brew this beer today. I'm gonna brew it according to his instructions exactly, and where there's gaps in those instructions, I'm gonna fill in as best as I can using the intuition I have as a brewer. So without further ado, let's get started. Before we jump into the recipe, I do want to thank a couple folks for helping support the channel. Northern Brewer, where you can get all the ingredients that you need for this batch of beer and many others. Go check them out. And also Claw Hammer Supply, who make the system that I've been brewing on for the last two years or so. In this case, I'll be using the 240 volt 10 gallon system, and you'll see it in action here. It's a great system, and I do recommend checking them out. So while I enjoy this pour of very green, we're gonna go ahead and talk about the recipe. For the grist on this one, it's a really simple grist overall. He says use 85% pale two row malt. Now this can be interpreted many ways. A pale two row base malt could be nearly anything. Uh, it could be Maris Otter if you wanted it to be. It could be Golden Promise. It could be basic raw or two row. So it's really up to you, the brewer, to choose the specific ingredient that you think fits best in this particular style. In my case, I'm gonna be using Mecca Grade La Manta Pale Malt, which is um, kind of a high-end pale two-row malt. Uh, I used it previously in the cream ale that I made not too long ago, and I was really blown away by how good that flavor was. I think it'll be a nice malt base for this beer. So in a five-gallon batch, 85% is gonna be 12 pounds. Next up, we have flaked oats at 10%, so that's a pound and a half. Flaked oats are gonna give body and mouthfeel to the beer, but Nate seems to think that only a light hand with these flaked grains is the answer. Uh, I'm assuming this is for a hazy treehouse style IPA, so normally with hazy IPAs, you're looking at 20, 30, 40% of the grist being something akin to wheat and oats. In this case, it's only 10%, so it should be interesting to see what happens because of that. Finally, you add 5% carafoam. Carafoam, carapils, dextrin malt goes by many names. That's about three quarters of a pound in this recipe. And uh, that's gonna help add a little bit more body to the beer, but it's also gonna add residual sweetness and keep the beer from getting too dry, which is important for hazy IPAs nowadays. This grist is targeting a 1070 OG and should get us about a 7% beer if we do things correctly. Moving on to hops now. Uh, so we have a bittering edition of Magnum. He says 20 IBUs of Magnum. The Magnum I have is 13% alpha acid, and that means we're adding about 16 grams at 60 minutes, which uh, equates to just over half an ounce of Magnum. We're following this up with some more boil additions, and again, this is not how I would personally craft a hazy IPA, but I am not a master. So uh, we're gonna defer to the masters here. We're gonna start with a 20 minute edition with five IBUs each of Citra, Simcoe, and Amarillo. Translating that into actual amounts uh, for a five gallon batch, and in my case, with my hops, uh, that's about seven grams or a quarter ounce of each hop going in. Uh, and then at the zero minute mark, we're gonna do the exact same thing. There's also a significant amount of dry hops in this one. There's no real guidance here in the dry hops. Uh, he says, feel free to dry hop between 15 and 30 grams per liter, which is an, uh, that's an aggressive dry hop. Because I like getting beer out of it and not hop sludge when I keg, um, I really do like to use cryo hops. So we're actually gonna be using cryo citra, cryo simcoe, and cryo amarillo for our dry hop. To hit 15 grams per liter of a dry hopping rate, that is an ounce and three quarters of each cryo hop. Now, if you're using the non-cryo versions of these dry hops, um, it's actually gonna be three and a half ounces of each hop. There's a ton of hops going into the dry hop. It is absolutely going to absorb a ton of beer. So cryo is really the way to go with these. So you get more beer out of it at the end of the process. Uh, but those dry hops are gonna be going in 
on day seven of fermentation. So he doesn't say specifically whether to dry hop during primary or dry hop during secondary. In one of the videos about this recipe, he does mention get your beer finished down through primary first and then add the dry hops in a soft crash. So what we're doing is crashing to 60 Fahrenheit and then adding those dry hops for five days. After that, we'll cold crash for real. Now for the water profile, which is the secret sauce, as he says. One can infer that since the majority of their beers and definitely their best known offerings are all hazy New England style IPAs, the water profile for that is pretty well known. The water profile for this should have a ton of minerals in it. Should be a roughly two to one chloride to sulfate ratio. That is gonna cut down on the bitterness and allow for some of the malt sweetness to shine through, but also give us that juicy character that we really want out of these IPAs. So I'm targeting a water profile of 128 parts per million of calcium, nine parts per million of magnesium, 39 parts per million of sodium, 219 parts per million of chloride, 130 parts per million of sulfate, and zero parts per million of bicarbonate. In order to get that water profile, first I'm starting off with good water, as one must always with brewing. I'm starting off with eight gallons of Poland Spring, spring water, uh, and I'm gonna add to that five grams of gypsum, three grams of Epsom, three grams of sodium chloride, and 10 grams of calcium chloride. For the yeast on this one, he calls out specifically London Ale 3, no substitutes. So we're pitching London Ale 3. As always, we're gonna make sure that since this is a higher gravity beer, I wanna have a good fermentation with it. So I am gonna make a one liter starter for this particular batch out of my London Ale 3. And finally, for the mash on this beer, he says a simple single infusion mash anywhere from 152 to 154 for a good balance of body and drinkability. I think to hit this OG properly, I'm gonna go with a mash temperature of 152 for 60 minutes. So the hot side's not too complicated, it's the cold side that's complicated. And we'll talk about that more during the fermentation segment, but I'm very excited to get this thing going, so let's go ahead and get brewing. I added eight gallons of spring water to my 240 volt, 10 gallon claw hammer supply system and started to heat that up to the mash temperature of 152 Fahrenheit. As this was going on, of course, I milled my grain uh, with the exception of the flaked grains. Those are all added after milling. And I measured out my water salts and added those to the strike water as it was heating up. Once I hit that mash in temperature of 152 Fahrenheit, I mashed in with the entire grist, stirring thoroughly to ensure that there were no clumps and uh, everything was looking pretty good at this point. At this time, I took a pH measurement and I saw an on-target pH of 5.35, uh, which was perfect. Once I hit that 60 minute mark, I stepped up to 170 Fahrenheit for 15 minutes for the mash out. After 15 minutes, I pulled the grain basket out and let that drain for another 15 minutes. As this was going on, I also heated up to a temperature slightly below boiling just to get a head start on things. I also added a small amount of anti-foaming agent at this time to prevent a boil over. Once I was ready to start the boil, I set the controller to 50% power, so that's more than enough to maintain a good rolling boil. And I added my bittering addition, which was the 16 grams of Magnum. 40 minutes later at the 20 minute mark, I added my quarter ounce each of Citra, Simcoe, and Amarillo. I let the boil continue for another 10 minutes, and then I added a small amount of yeast nutrient in order to help facilitate the fermentation. 10 minutes after that, I ended the boil, and I also added my zero minute hop addition, which was another quarter ounce of Citra, Simcoe, and Amarillo. At this time, I whirlpooled the wort to help coagulate all of the hop debris in the center of the kettle. I did this by turning on the pump for five minutes and then letting the wort rest for 15 minutes. And at that point, I began to chill and transfer over into my Brewbuilt X2 fermenter. I was able to achieve a single pass chill down to 65 Fahrenheit through my X Chillerator Counterflow Chiller and uh, was able to transfer relatively quickly. Once I got everything fully transferred, I oxygenated with pure oxygen, adding about one liter into the whole thing. After that, I added my full one liter starter of London Ale 3. Unfortunately, I was a bit short on my transfer volume. However, when I measured my OG, I found it to be 1072, which was actually two points higher than the original planned OG. At this point, I set everything to ferment at 68 Fahrenheit and I capped up the fermenter and left it to ferment. 
So for the fermentation on this beer, um, in the case of following Treehouse's recipe to the T, I do have a few notes. The first thing is that he says, ferment this at 70 Fahrenheit. And he says, London Ale 3 is expressive at different temperatures, and that's very true. I personally would not recommend fermenting at 70 Fahrenheit because that is what is intended for a commercial brewing setup. So in those massive, huge conical fermenters that Treehouse has, there's a lot of pressure that builds up that actually cuts down on the amount of rotten fruit esters that English yeast make when they're fermented at higher temperatures like that. We want the nice, gentle stone fruit and tropical fruit esters that London 3 can make at lower temperatures. In a home brewing situation, unless you're deliberately pressure fermenting from the get-go, you really do want to ferment English yeast a bit colder. So I'll be pitching mine at 65 and fermenting at 68. Because I do not have that added head pressure, I can't really squeak too much more out of it at higher temperatures. That's just been my personal experience. I'm not saying to do it that way, I'm just recommending uh, that you do, especially on a home brew setup. The fermentation really should go relatively quickly, especially with a starter, and uh, fermenting at a relatively normal temperature shouldn't take very long to get through that primary fermentation. The dry hop is the most important part of this, and because we are dry hopping at the very end of fermentation, there's a little bit of an oxidation hazard here, so depending on your equipment, you really should take a few things into consideration with that. So if you're fermenting in a bucket-style fermenter, you might want to go ahead and use a magnet technique to drop those dry hops in without ever opening the bucket fermenter. Otherwise, if you have a conical, you have a lot more options in order to avoid oxidation. I'm going to be trying out my brand new Brewbuilt X2 conical fermenter in this particular uh, brew, and I think that there's some features on that piece of equipment that will really help me avoid oxidation. So my plan is once I reach that seven day mark, I'm going to go ahead and soft crash down to 60 Fahrenheit. There's a jacket on this fermenter, which is ridiculous that we can get this at a homebrew scale now. Using either ice water or glycol, you can bring that temperature of the beer down relatively quickly to 60 Fahrenheit and then we'll add our dry hops then. That colder dry hop helps prevent um, hop creep actually. So hop creep being the uh, creation of diacetyl due to enzymes in dry hops that partially restart fermentation and it can cause diacetyl in a final beer if you're not careful about it. So you can either let that hop creep happen and let the beer condition for a couple more weeks or you could try to dry hop colder and then never raise the beer up to a high temperature ever again after that. So that's the method that we're trying out today. Now, what we need to do in order to be successful with that is to flush the headspace of the fermenter with CO2, especially if the fermentation's already done. There's not gonna be active fermentation pushing CO2 out, so what we'll do is, using that second one and a half inch tri-clamp port on the lid, we're gonna go ahead and flush CO2 into that fermenter and then purge that headspace. As we do that, then we'll add the dry hops directly into the beer, and then we'll go ahead and spund after that. So we're gonna use a spunding valve set to 15 PSI and add that on top of the fermenter after adding our dry hops. This is gonna do a few things. Firstly, it's gonna help control the fermentation so that it never goes above 15 PSI after we add those dry hops. Secondly, it's gonna start carbonating the beer for us. And thirdly, it's gonna help dissolve some more of those hop oils and hop aromatics into the beer. It's gonna help prevent that CO2 from ripping those aromatics out of the beer and dispersing them into the environment, which is sad. We don't, we don't want that. Our dry hop is gonna go for no more than five days. Anything longer than that, and we do start to risk getting grassy flavors introduced into the beer, which don't always blend well. So we wanna make sure that we keep that to a point where we get a lot of flavor and a lot of aroma out of the dry hop, but not so much of the grassy flavor. So at five days, uh, once I hit that point, I'm gonna, again, use the unit tank to cold crash. So because of that headspace pressure, when I cold crash, there won't be a vacuum created, there won't be any suck back of oxygen, it'd just be that CO2 that's in headspace, some of that will get absorbed into the beer, and uh, we'll get the temperature of the beer down to about 33 Fahrenheit, or about one degree Celsius. That'll drop those dry hops out, that'll drop the yeast out, and then we'll be able to uh, separate that from underneath the beer, and then we'll keg the beer itself directly from that point forward. Then we should be able to get that on tap and serving it relatively fresh. It probably will have some degree of hop burn, so if I keep it on tap and kind of effectively lager it, cold condition it for about a week, that hop burn should go away pretty quickly after that, and it should be nice. This very green that I picked up at Treehouse, the first week it had some hop burn in the can, but now it's about a week old and that's gone away. 
I'm excited to see how well the X2 does. I'll probably put out a dedicated video on it at some other point, but uh, keep in mind, you don't need that kind of equipment to ferment this kind of beer. I just gave you instructions on how to do it earlier in a bucket style fermenter. You can do the same thing in a Firmzilla. You can do the same thing in an Anvil Fermenter King. You can do the same thing in many, many other lower budget fermenters out there that there's plenty of options. And don't feel like you need this kind of equipment to actually make successful IPAs with. It helps, it certainly makes things a lot more convenient, um, but it's absolutely by no means necessary. Really quickly, I do wanna cover some alternative yeasts for this uh, fermentation. London 3 is the one that's called out by Nate, but if you don't have access to London 3 for some weird reason, I do recommend checking out uh, some of the Imperial offerings like Conan, like Juice, those are some phenomenal uh, New England IPA strains. You can also check out some dry options. So Verdant IPA is a really good one. I just made a pretty good uh, New England IPA with that strain recently. Gets a bit drier than the other options, so do keep that in mind. But otherwise, having a dry strain at your hands uh, for making really good New England IPAs is a very powerful thing. So that's a great option. So there's a few mangrove jack strains out there. I don't have mangrove jacks in my areas. I've never brewed with it, so I don't want to recommend it if not having used it. Uh, but there are plenty of strains from that manufacturer as well. Just pick a good English strain, pick one that's themed towards IPAs if you can find one and you'll have a good time. Ferment these on 65 to 68 and you should be good. You can also use a fruity Kvike strain like Voss or Hornendal when you're fermenting them relatively hot, like 95 Fahrenheit. It'll rip through fermentation very fast, so do keep that in mind, um, but it will give pretty pleasant uh, characteristics to the beer. It will be different than when fermented with a uh, English yeast like this, but it should be a pretty solid option. Just to recap, what we're doing is I'm gonna ferment this with London Ale 3, a one liter starter of that, pitching at 65 and fermenting at 68 for seven days. That should be the completion of our primary fermentation. At that point, I'll dump out the tube of the yeast to the bottom dump port of the conical, and we'll add our dry hops. I'll be adding CO2 to the fermenter to make sure that we don't have any sort of oxidation issues. We'll add all of our dry hops, that's one and three quarter ounces each of Cryo Citra, Cryo Amarillo, and Cryo Simcoe. And those will go in and sit in the beer for about five days at 60 Fahrenheit. Once the dry hop has finished, I'll cold crash down to about 33 Fahrenheit and we'll get this thing uh, transferred into a keg shortly after that. And then at that point, should be able to lager it until that hop burn goes away and serve a delicious Treehouse style IPA. If we've done our homework, if we've done it right, it should come out pretty nicely. So hopefully it does end up just as good. And um, yeah, we'll just have to wait and see. So I'll see you in a few weeks. And until then, cheers. So the fermentation was pretty much on schedule the entire time. I had a completion of primary fermentation within seven days, then I soft crashed it down to 60 Fahrenheit, and over 24 hours that allowed all the yeast and hops that were in solution to drop down, and I dumped those out via the bottom port. At that point I also added in my dry hops and then let them sit in the beer for five days according to plan. Shortly after that I cold crashed down to 35 or so and uh, was able to transfer the beer off of the yeast cake the next day. So overall the fermentation actually only took about 12 days and I was able to keg it right away. It had zero hop burn which was really surprising so uh, I actually had a, the ability to get it on tap immediately um, which is uh, great because we had really really fresh flavors. So the beer is called Beach House IPA and comes in at 7.1% ABV and approximately 45 IBUs. The beer is pouring a nice bright orange color. Uh, it's slightly darker than my usual New England IPAs tend to be. However, it's also not nearly as dark as some commercial offerings that I've seen. And it comes with a really solid opaque haze to it. And uh, the head is not particularly impressive, but that's also because this particular sample is slightly under carbonated being so fresh off of the unit tank. Um, I am trading appearance and carbonation for sheer flavor today. And that's the reason why. That being said, the head retention is not too bad. There's good lacing on it and uh, it keeps up good appearances overall regardless. All right, so now let's go in for aroma. The aroma I'm getting is mostly like a nice mango pineapple kind of character. There's a little bit of a stone fruit in there. It's a little bit of uh, a hint of maltiness as well. I don't really need to get all that close to the beer to really get a good feel of how the aroma is gonna be. Uh, it's quite pungent. So now let's go in for mouthfeel. 
Hmm. Oh, man, that's good. This is honestly one of the best hazy IPAs I think I've ever made. Um, so that's kind of nice. I'll talk about the flavor here in a minute though. The mouthfeel is soft. Uh, we got that part 100% right. It's very fluffy actually too. That comes partially from the 10% flaked oats that we put in there, but really it's amplified by the water profile, which I think we got 100% correct. So there's that fluffiness, there's roundness to it. There's just a soft quality. Um, and it also has a rather full feeling mouthfeel. Um, not too much so, um, but it's medium full, I'd say overall. The carbonation level's kind of on the low side, uh, to be honest, and that's because it is just very fresh. It came out of the unit tank pretty much at this carbonation level, and it is allowing the maltiness to come through. It's allowing the flavors to express themselves in many different ways that might be covered up by excess carbonation. So I actually, for one, am pretty happy with the carbonation level in general. I would keep it lower just to allow those flavors to come out and express themselves more. You'd never guess that this is a 7.1% beer. It doesn't drink like that at all. It's much more drinkable than you might expect for something as strong as it is. All right, so now let's go in for flavor because this is an amazing beer. Mm. <laughs> oh man, this is good. <laughs> this is in line with what I would expect from a treehouse recipe. I'll say that much. I don't think this is necessarily one of their beers, um, but it is certainly an outstanding recipe. Flavor-wise, this has a lot to offer. It's actually very complex for an IPA. Um, and I mean that in that it has multiple dimensions of flavor, not just in malt, but also in hops, of course, and in yeast. So. Starting with the malt, uh, it's the simplest one. It's very pleasant, it's very crackery, it's very um, cereal-like and, and uh, very pleasant. It's, <laughs> it's got a little bit of a sweetness to it because of that dextrin malt, um, but it complements the hops extremely well because it takes that edge off of the bitterness and allows them to really shine through as more of a fruity character. Uh, and the malt has this little tiny bit of sweetness behind it that boosts that in a nice way. I wouldn't add any more or less dextrin malt to this. Now onto the stars of the show, the hops and the yeast here. The hops and the yeast are coming through and interacting in an incredibly, incredibly playful way. That's really delicious. Very light fruitiness, um, zero bitterness zero perceptible bitterness. I did add some Magnum to bitter. I did add some boil additions, obviously, of the Citrus and Cohen Amarillo, but we don't have any apparent bitterness due to that. The hops are really singing together in this beautiful combination of mango and pineapple. Very, very strong pineapple character to this. There's also strawberry in this. There's also a very powerful orange note as well. Just a super pleasant orange juice character. If anything, most of the flavors in this beer can be described as just purely juice. Um, and there's this lovely combination of those characters in here in a very juicy way. There's stone fruit notes, there's peach, um, there's a little tiny bit of banana uh, as well, but that's about it. This thing tastes very similar to a fruit smoothie and it's actually throwing me off. When these three hops blend together and when they combine with the uh, yeast characteristics, you get a very different flavor profile than if you had used them individually. Um, normally with Citra, I'm getting like a dankness. With Simcoe, I'm getting kind of like a cattiness. And with Amarillo, usually I do get that fruit character. Um, but it's nothing like the fruit punch explosion I'm getting out of this. Um, and it's really interesting, I find none of the cattiness nor the dankness in this beer at all. It's just pure fruit, pure tropical fruit. I think a good deal of that is due to the techniques used. That cold dry hopping step really made a big difference in terms of keeping that bitterness down that you sometimes get from dry hops. We have no hop creep. We have more gentle extraction of the oils in the hops, allowing for, I think, more of this fruity character to shine through. Combined with that, a water profile that cuts down on the bitterness and a little bit of residual sweetness from the dextrin malt, and you get tons and tons and tons of this sweeter fruit flavor as opposed to the more bitter characteristics of hops. That is a big learning point for me individually. I will not be afraid to admit that. At the very beginning of this video, I'm like, I don't know, we're not doing a whirlpool. I don't know, we're just only doing 10% oats. Oh my goodness. 
Consider my lesson learned. Uh, there are many ways to make a hazy IPA, but so far this might be my favorite one, and it didn't even include a whirlpool, and that's what I thought was the staple of a good, juicy, hazy IPA. Turns out I might be wrong about that. That's another reason I think why my most uh, recent hazy IPA before this one was more bitter. Uh, is because of that extended whirlpool that I did. I'm always learning new stuff, and as brewers, we really should be striving to learn as much new stuff as possible. And um, this is definitely a really cool experience to have unlocking that secret of how to make a beer taste like this. I, for one, am very happy, I'm very grateful to Nate from Treehouse for lending us this recipe and letting us try it out. Um, it's always cool when big names, especially like Treehouse, reach back to the roots and don't leave the homebrewers behind. And so because of that, I'm very thankful to Nate for giving us this recipe and showing us how it's done. As far as potential improvements go for this one, it's hard to think of any, but I think the only potential improvement I might have for this beer is really just more hops. Um, I, I dry hopped to that 15 grams per liter level that was recommended. Uh, he said, go up to 25 if you want to. I might do that next time because the hops here are balanced, the, the beer is exceptionally well balanced, but I always could use more. I think it would be really interesting to see what would happen if we went up to a much higher level of hopping, especially with this combination. I don't think you can go wrong with that. So at the end of the day, is this green, is this Julius, is it Haze, is it uh, any one of their other flagship beers? No, it's not. However, it is still a killer beer, and it is something that I would not be surprised if it was up there in the lineup of Treehouse's beers. It can stand with those as brewed right now. I honestly believe that the only real difference between those beers and this one might just be the hop combos. So experiment around, maybe throw some Galaxy in here and you might get closer to uh, some of the other ones that we mentioned earlier. Anyway guys, if you enjoyed the video, please go ahead, hit that like button and subscribe if you haven't already and comment down below. What are your thoughts? Have you brewed this beer already? The recipe has been out on YouTube for a little while, so I see no reason why you haven't. If you haven't brewed it, I highly recommend doing so. It's a very good recipe um, and I would certainly make it a second time. This keg is not going to last a long time, I'll tell you that much. If you want to support the channel, please consider picking up some merchandise. You can find that down in the merch store. There's a link in the description box. You can get a bunch of uh, t-shirts, hoodies, stuff like that. This design is amongst them, uh, but there's plenty of others out there so check that out it's a great way to support me i also have a patreon and my patreon supporters have made huge upgrades for the production quality of this channel and allowing me to make a better product at the end of the day that goes up on youtube so i am really grateful to my patrons for helping out that way i also have channel memberships and there's the super thanks button down below as well if you want to hit either of those i really appreciate it nonetheless because it all goes back into this channel I also have an Amazon store where you can find most of the equipment that I use to brew with and film with and work with in general. If it's on Amazon and I've used it and I recommend it, it'll be on that store. So check that out. If you want to follow me in more than just YouTube, I'm also active on Instagram and Facebook as The Apartment Brewer. So check those out and you got some time as well. Uh, and you'll see some more frequent content than just YouTube. So if you guys are still here, at the very end of the video, thank you very much for sticking around. These videos take a ton of work to produce, and uh, I really do appreciate it when folks can actually uh, see the whole thing from end to end. So this one goes out specifically to you guys. And until the next one, cheers. Cheers.